Hello, welcome to this virtual summit, Apart But Together, Expanding Our Community. My name is Laura Taro. I am a Senior Associate for Professional Development at the National Foreign Language Center at the University of Maryland, and it is a pleasure to work with you, to be with you for this virtual summit. The topic I'm going to address is assessing and grading for learning. This is a topic that I feel is extremely important because it is critical in terms of advancing our learners in their pathway to proficiency in a language. I have two key goals. I want to explore the connection between unit goals and assessment for each mode of communication. And then at the very end, I want to do some provocative thinking perhaps about what constitutes best practices when we say that we are grading for performance. So let's think about this image here. The teacher is in front of the classroom. The students are sitting there. They appear to be attentive. No one is sleeping, although one head is down. And Ruby Payne, in a framework for understanding poverty, said that teaching is what occurs outside of the head. So we have the teacher, but we really don't know what's going on in the heads of these learners. And having taught all levels, K-12, but especially when in high school, I know that learners are quite capable of maintaining the art of the attentive face, meaning they make eye contact, they nod their head, they appear to be engaged, and meanwhile, they're texting under the bench, under the table, under the desk. Ruby Payne contrasted this with learning. Learning then must be what occurs inside the head. I need to find a way, and that is evidence through assessment, whether it is formative assessment, checks for learning, summative assessment, I need to find a way to know if every individual student has actually learned what I believe I have taught. Doug Lamov said, perhaps the most salient characteristic of a great teacher is the ability to recognize the difference between I taught it and they learned it. And if you've been teaching for a while, you have surely heard a learner say, we didn't do that yesterday. We didn't do that last year. And what they're basically saying is, well, you may have covered it, but I didn't learn it. And if we do not actively store and learn the information, we will not retain it. It is no longer in our brains. We can't draw on it. And it creates a cycle of teaching and reviewing that is an incredible time waster in our classrooms. So five key considerations for this session. First, we're gonna look at creating unit goals that truly capture what learners can do with the language. We're gonna look at creating performance assessment tasks for each mode of communication. And to the best of our ability, we're gonna make sure that they're real world to the extent that is possible in the classroom. We'll look at using rubrics that clearly provide feedback on the performance. We're gonna look at what, is what are called inappropriate grading practices, which when I first saw these, I got angry. And then finally, a little bit on assessing and grading against standards. Not much there, just enough to start us on a thinking path. So what is a quality unit? Is there a mindset for unit lesson and curriculum design? When Donna Clementi and I co-authored Keys to Planning for Learning, we used this image to pull what we thought would reflect a quality unit of instruction. The unit would allow us to get to know ourselves, our communities, and our world better. In so doing, we would build interculturality. We would have the opportunity to work within each mode of communication. And finally, the content of that unit would come from the world readiness standards. Of course, we would communicate, but we would communicate about cultures, other disciplines, content. We would make comparisons. And finally, we would use our language beyond our classroom. So we're asking ourselves consistently, is the language of this unit lesson communicatively purposeful? 
am I framing topics in a way that I hear that 12 year old using them on the streets of, you can fill in the city, Paris, Beijing. Is the unit, the lesson culturally focused? Have I deliberately tried to bring authentic culture in? I can do that with authentic text, with authentic images, with the topics I choose to address. Am I trying to the best of my ability to find topics that are intrinsically interesting for the age of my learner? We have an unfortunate circumstance in the United States where so many of our students start late. And so it's hard to interest them in colors, unless maybe we associate colors with that healthy food plate is colorful, or painting your room certain colors provoke certain moods, or if your favorite color is green, what does that say about your personality? Is the lesson cognitively engaging? Am I learning about my community, about the world I live in through the language? Or am I just learning language? And so we have to make sure that we're provoking thinking in the unit goals that we create. And then finally, as I outlined earlier, are the standards present? So let's look at a simplistic unit. Simplistic in the sense that almost every world language teacher teaches a unit on food at some place in their curriculum and possibly in multiple places with different purposes. So we frame it under the theme of AP Global Challenges. We call it Let's Eat. Um, we frame an essential question that is thought provoking that can be answered in the target language by the student at their performance level. And we think about the images suggest, well, what could I do in this unit? And it may be that I do all of this or I toss one out as I develop the unit, but we've got some ideas. We've done some things in the past, and this is suggesting hunger and regional dishes, healthy eating, and um, my favorite in France, the Kill the Soda campaign. I use my basic ideas, my brainstorming, to begin to develop unit goals. And here you can see that they're gonna compare hunger in their community with hunger in other parts of the world, identifying causes. They're gonna look at cultural dishes and decide whether they're healthy or not. They're going to think about health and healthy and unhealthy foods in their own diet. They're gonna talk about their likes and dislikes with regard to food, and as a point of interest, they're gonna look at school lunches from around the world because I know from personal experience that that's a fascinating topic for students who love to complain about the lunches in their own school. So with those goals in mind, I need to step back and I need to really reflect, are these the right goals? Do they convey what, what learners will do with the language? Do they explore the essential question? Is each of these goals giving students some information so that they can answer the question, what role does food play in our lives? Are they conveyed as output? Because evidence of learning is best achieved through interpersonal and presentational performance, but we know that they have to be addressed in all three modes because input must proceed output. And do I see evidence, of course communication is there, but do I see evidence of culture in these goals? Yes, I see school lunches. Do I see content in the connection standard? Yes, I'm looking at hunger as a global issue. Do I see comparisons, comparing school lunches? Do I see communities, oh, little weak on that, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And that's how you think about, do I need to add a goal? Do I remove a goal before I go any further? I also want to ask myself, are they age appropriate and cognitively engaging? So while these may be right for someone who's in high school, they may be wrong for someone who's in sixth grade, or they may need to be adapted. And most importantly, 
can I hear in my head or visualize what my students will write or speak? And is it achievable in the target language at that performance range? Because if not, we're surely going to be sending them off to Google Translate because they still want that good grade. Once we have uh, our unit goals in place, we're ready to think about our assessment tasks. And the actual integrated performance assessment really, for me, represents that we must assess all three modes. How we assess all three modes certainly has to vary according to the circumstances. And if we are online during this year, we're probably going to have to think very carefully about assessment practices. So the important part is we must assess all three modes. So when we're creating our performance assessment tasks that are real world in nature, we're asking ourselves, okay, what am I going to have learners listen to, read, and or view so that they can demonstrate that they are understanding this new language on their own? What am I going to have them do in the presentational mode? What will they produce that can be shared with others? In the interpersonal mode, what types of conversations will they have with their peers in class or with others in the target um, language that allow me to see that they're moving into these unrehearsed, negotiated meaning conversations. It is true that we're gonna to have to prepare them for it, but the actual conversation is going to be unrehearsed with an unknown partner. And it's going to be genuine. And then I'm not gonna have them ask questions where they already know the answer. So the conversation wouldn't be, what is the weather like today, when we can all see what the weather is like today. So if we think about that, and I know that there's too much text on this slide, so you may wanna pause it, you may wanna go back to it later and look at it more carefully. But when Donna and I were talking about assessment and describing and outlining assessment in keys, we made a point that interpretive is critically important. It cannot wait till the end of a unit. It should be done throughout the unit because if learners are not understanding the new input, then they are not going to be able to produce it. So multiple interpretive tasks um, are shown here where they might read an infographic on hunger, complete a graphic organizer indicating causes. They might listen to the teacher describe some images from Hungry Planet and select the image that's being described. They might read a recipe and based on what they read, determine whether it's healthy or unhealthy and check a major reason why or why not. They might read a, a critique for a restaurant and decide what type of person might want to go to that restaurant. So frequent multiple interpretive assessments throughout the unit. An assessment in the interpretive mode at this level would be done in English. We're not asking them to produce language to get a sense of whether they understand or not, because they're going to produce their language in the presentational and interpersonal modes. In presentational, there are two types of assessment here. On demand, what can you produce in writing in the moment? And so um, it could be that if we're online, that's going to be a two minute quick write. And then you're going to take a picture of it and you're going to send it to me so that I keep you from going to Google Translate. But on the polished one, we want to make sure that if we're going to do a project, that there's an audience beyond the teacher for that project. And even to the best extent possible, an audience beyond the classroom. Because when students produce language like this, that is just for the teacher, then they're going to produce language to get a good grade. And so it's a catch 22 for all of us. Here you can see that while I didn't have a goal that expressly addressed community, I could easily go back and add a goal that they're going to do this type of community work, creating this promotional piece um, to promote a hunger drive within the community. And finally, in the interpersonal mode, can I listen to two students or a small group of students or pop two students into a breakout room 
and find and listen to them have a conversation about food. They're looking at pictures like you look at on a menu. They're talking about likes and dislikes, whether they want to try them or not. They're commenting on how their habits compare. What do you eat for breakfast? If I were in France, they can talk about hunger. Are you hungry? I am. Oh, how are you feeling? I'm tired. I mean, there are many, many things that they can pull into the interpersonal conversation. The important thing is, is that you have heard this conversation in your head and you know that you've prepped them through your lesson goals to be able to do this by the end of the unit. If we're online, will we do these big conversations, some of them? Maybe not. Maybe we'll just be more intentional about, about checking for interpersonal language every time they're with us in the synchronous mode. So we're asking ourselves some critical questions about our assessments. Are the tasks real world to the extent that is possible in the classroom? Do the tasks allow learners to demonstrate how well they have met the goals of the unit? And that's critically important because it is so easy in assessment to revert to something we've always done without really thinking about what we've prepared them to do in our instruction. Are they answering in some aspect that essential question? Do they incorporate 21st century learning goals? Are we able to prove to others that our classes are fostering critical thinking, creativity, collaboration? We know that if our tests are real world, they're fostering communication skills, but we need to be mindful of the others as well. And finally, an appeal that there are multiple interpretive tasks for the reasons that I outlined earlier. This allows our students to experience success. And if they experience success, we know that they're far more motivated to continue, that they have that growth mindset that they need. So with assessments in place, we need to think about the rubrics we use, making sure that those rubrics are giving appropriate feedback. And there is no one right way to design your rubric but there probably are wrong ways to create a rubric. So let's just look at a couple of things about feedback. And this um, infographic was taken from the edition of Educational Leadership shown here. It's an excellent edition. At the end of every um, Educational Leadership magazine, they summarize in seven key points the articles. And I pulled out two. When we give a grade as part of our feedback, students routinely read only as far as the grade. And I've had that experience. They saw the B on the paper. They said, I'm fine. It's a B. It's great. Or the C student who said, got a C. Or the, a D student who said, whew, pass this one. You know, I knew that was wrong at the time. I just didn't know what I know today and how to deal with it. And then this one, effective feedback occurs during the learning while there is still time to act on it. And I think that this means that feedback at the lesson level, the checks for learning, the mini tasks that we give feedback on are far more important than the summative assessments. And somehow we've shifted too much of our thinking to the end product and we've forgotten that we're coaches that have to prepare them along the way. So what does a good rubric incorporate? Well, ACTFL gives us the performance domains. And when we're talking about performance, we're talking about these three criteria. Functions, which describe what learners will do with the language, the types of tasks that they will complete, they'll describe, they'll give an opinion. The context, that's the situations that we're gonna ask them to be able to perform in which is why they are parameters of performance and not proficiency. What topics are they comfortable with because we've covered those topics in our instructional settings? And the text type, what type of language can they produce? And so I have to make sure that I design my task to allow 
for production of language at or slightly above where I expect them to perform. So I wouldn't want to design a word level task if I'm hoping for sentences. I wouldn't want to describe a task that uh, asks for paragraphs if they're still at the simple sentence level. So I need to measure that. And the best thing we can do is write out an exemplar when we design our tasks. In the qualities of performance, we have language control. How accurate is the language? Is it accurate enough to communicate? Is the vocabulary there that they need to complete the task in an appropriate way? Are they using vocabulary that is appropriate for their level and not reverting to simplistic vocabulary from previous years? Are they able to use the communication strategies that they need to? Circumlocution when they forget a word, asking a follow-up question, expressing confusion. And finally, are they being asked to pull on their cultural knowledge in the tasks that I design to the fullest extent possible? Because interculturality is that blending of language and culture. And so I've got to allow for culture to be part of every task. So this is a rubric slightly modified from the one that is in keys and that has five of those domains, actually more because they're a bit blended. The questions are listed there because students respond better to questions. Am I understood here in the presentational mode? It's not language accuracy. It's that I don't make errors that cause confusion. Even AP says no pattern of errors. Is the vocabulary there that they need to complete all aspects of the task? And since this is presentational, can I have an expectation that they use some personal vocabulary? Did they complete all aspects of the task? Or did they try to fudge one and stay on it and just do that? Do I go beyond the expectations of the task to get that 10? Is my writing organized according to my performance range. So the wording here is to try to make this rubric usable at different levels of instruction. And we know that we want them to use different types of sentences. We know we want them to progress beyond the words. And then finally, did I represent any understanding of target culture? And so I'm going to give them feedback based on their performance. One tip, if you use this entire rubric with something you're collecting, have the students score their own work first because it gives you an indication of where they think they are and it makes it easier for you to confirm or really 80% of the time, pat them on the back and say, no, you're doing better than you think you are. But what I really wanna stress is that in order for this feedback to be ongoing, we need to make certain that from time to time, we just pull out one line of the rubric and they know what they're work being scored on today. And so they know they're gonna get feedback on organization and they pay maybe closer attention to that today. So I did a timed writing for four minutes, gave them a, a time to look it over and turn it in, score themselves, give their own grade, and then I give them feedback with maybe a comment or two. This allows me to give more feedback more frequently, given the numbers of students that many of us have or have had. I can do the same thing with a running can-do record. I don't have to try to score the entire range of interpersonal criteria. I can just simply pop in and out of meeting rooms if we're online, listening for student one to describe a, the picture that they all have of a school lunch. And I can check that they're doing it. I know I'm building towards a bigger task, but I don't have to wait for the bigger task in order to start monitoring progress. And I call it a running can-do record because those of you that are familiar with elementary or have elementary students, you know about the running records that elementary teachers use in reading. And so this is just a version of a running record for us. So let's look at grading practices and a sample grading with the few minutes that remain. 
Ken O'Connor stressed that all grades have to be consistent, accurate, meaningful, and support learning. And what that really means for us as teachers of language is that our grade books have to be the same, certainly within a school, absolutely across a language. We have to have the same beliefs, the same practices when we report grading. If not, it's like being a JV coach in baseball, then the varsity coach, and we change the rules between JV and varsity. And many of us have heard a student say, I don't understand, or more likely a parent, my daughter got a B last year and this year she's getting a C. Well, her daughter probably hasn't changed, but maybe the grade book has. So Ken O'Connor, in an effort to make all of us a bit angry the first time we see this, defines several practices as being inappropriate. And if you are like me, the first time you see this, if it's your first time, you are gonna see one that makes you angry. And I invite you to go to the Google Doc and raise your questions and have that discussion there. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have about this. But it's hard to see, if you haven't thought about it, why these things should not be part of a grade. But if you look at them closely, you're gonna see that Many of the things that are here are compliance issues. Did they do it the way we wanted them to do it and in the time frame that we expected? And so we have to start to think about whether I'm grading behavior or grading performance. And only performance should be reflected in the grade book. There are other ways of dealing with behavior. The last one strikes fear into my heart every time I see it. What if I design a poor assessment? Sure, if everybody does poorly, I'll know it, but what if everybody just memorized the heck out of it and got a good grade? It's still a poor assessment if they can't do it a week later. So I have to think about my practices and I challenge all of us to do that now because summer is when I usually think about what went wrong with my grade book. So if we're thinking about grading and we're assessing against standards, our standards are given to us through the proficiency guidelines, but maybe more importantly for performance through the necessful, actful, can-do statements. And if you look for each mode, you can see what is expected by mode. And so it seems to me that if our standards are by mode, then we need to create a grade book that captures what our learners can do by mode. And for those of you that are much further into standards-based grading, congratulations, this is not sufficient. But this is a starting point that I've used uh, myself on, in my own teaching and then with other teachers, where learning checks reflects more of compliance and or non-real world tasks. I want to know if you can conjugate a verb, you're going to fill in the blanks. You'll never do that on the streets of Beijing. You'll never do that in, this, in Paris. So that has to be meaningless, nearly. So I'll put it in learning checks. But every other grade I give will be to the best of my ability based on a real world task. And I will determine which mode of communication it is. And I will pop the corresponding scores into that category of the gradebook. That allows me to say to a student, you are doing really well in interpretive and interpersonal. You need to work on presentational. And so even my gradebook now is a feedback mechanism for students. No matter how it gets averaged and compiled on the report card, I have the evidence behind that final grade that can give the, a learner meaningful information. So in a quick short period of time, hopefully I've met the goals of this um, session, looking at connections between unit goals and assessment and examining briefly best practices in grading. And I'm gonna leave you with this thought from Carol Dweck. And I chose it because assessment and grading are so linked to growth mindset. She said, love challenges, be intrigued by mistakes, enjoy effort, and keep on learning. 
And I believe if we get our unit goals, assessments, and grading practices in alignment, that we can truly foster this attitude of encouraging our students to enjoy the challenge, look at mistakes as opportunities to learn, appreciate the effort that they're putting in because they know they're continuing to learn. So thank you very much for being part of this summit. And I hope summer still has a couple of days of rest and relaxation for each of you. Thank you very much.